Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. Today, I'm sitting on a T72 tank because I'm at the Tank Museum, Bovington, to meet the curator, David Willey. About 40% of the Ukrainians' own tanks are already being knocked out. But that idea is if you've got Western tanks, you've got capabilities there that overmatch some of the Russian tanks. And if they can use that, as the Ukrainians have been using technology to, you know, amazing, all of us, the way they've been adapting, that could make a real difference on the battlefield. David, thanks so much for your time. Um, why is the tank important? Well, our history here at the museum is very much about how the tank's British invention in the First World War, but then we're never going to need it again after the First World War. We're never going to need them again after the Second World War. That was the argument if one soldier can knock out a tank. So our history is the end of the tank continuously, but look at the Ukraine, and then all of a sudden, you know, if we said a year ago, everyone, the media was saying, that's it, top attack weapons, end laws, javelins, taking out tanks, we're not going to need tanks again, are we? And yet the Ukrainians want more tanks from us. So our story is really how, yes, we can see technology advances, we can see new ways of defeating tanks, but most of the time, a tank can be adapted, tactics can be changed, and it still has a utility on the battlefield that up to now, nothing has actually replaced. And we've got here a Challenger 2 and a Leopard 1, both of them being used in Ukraine at the moment. How much of a difference are, are the tanks making to each side in this war? Well, we've seen there's what you might call the psychological or the, the media side of it. Tanks are very much the symbol of power. So when a tank gets knocked out, when we saw early on those Russian tanks being not particularly well used and being knocked out in numbers, you can see that was a dent to the Russian morale because they see themselves as the key tank nation in Europe. Um, they're the country that's made the most tanks in history. But with the Ukrainians, by being able to get hold of Western tanks and Western technology, not only are they replacing the tanks in their own arsenal that have already been lost, and we think perhaps about 40% of the Ukrainians' own tanks are already been knocked out, but that idea is if you've got Western tanks, you've got capabilities there that overmatch some of the Russian tanks. And if they can use that, as the Ukrainians have been using technology to, you know, amazing, all of us, the way they've been adapting, that could make a real difference on the battlefield. Since the war in Ukraine and the increased interest in the tank, how much of a difference has it made to your daily life? <laughs> So we're here, we're at a training establishment for the British Army and uh, as we're all aware, really in Britain for the last 20 years, the army was doing counterinsurgency, Afghanistan, Iraq. Now all of a sudden, not just the British Army, but the whole of NATO is waking up again to the potential of that phrase, big boys war. What if it's near peer enemies fighting each other? What if it is NATO and Russia? So that's now concentrated the minds that here we're a teaching collection as well as a public attraction. That means we're seeing a lot more soldiers coming down, relearning that idea about what major tank engagements might be like in the future. Do you want to go and have a look at some? Yeah, absolutely. Let's take a look. So, David, this is the Leopard 1. What are the main features? Um, so, with all tanks that we look at, it's mobility, firepower, and protection. This is a tank that was designed in the mid-1960s. It starts going into service. Rubber track pads because Western NATO tanks, we didn't want to chew up the roads, unlike the Russian, what they call aggressive track. It had a fantastically powerful MTU diesel in the back. And why was that important at the time? Because the Germans, their theory after the Second World War is let's make our tanks so quick on the battlefield that the idea is with any luck, the enemy won't be able to train their guns on them to knock them out. And that's why Leopard actually became a very successful tank. Um, the MTU diesels in the back here, diesel also as a fuel type is good in the sense it's harder to set on fire. So if you are hitting a Leopard, you've got more chance, more time to get out mm. um, and rescue yourself as it were from, from the battlefield. Leopards were made in quite large quantity, the Leopard one. 
and uh, it supplied lots of other NATO countries. It went around the world. Canada used them, a number of other countries. So that's good as well for the Ukrainians mm. because it means there's a stock of those tanks available mm. and spare parts to go with them. And of course, with all tanks, it's a firepower that's really perhaps the most important thing. And you can see here, this gun is what they call the L7 105 millimeter gun. Size at the end of the barrel, 10.5 centimeters, the size of the hole, so 105 millimeters. And that at its time was the best anti-tank gun in the world. And it remained so, it was on the first models of the Abrams tank. So even though Leopard 2 has a 120 millimeter gun mm. and has much more uh, modern protection systems on it, actually this in combat is still a powerful weapon. So you can understand why the Ukrainians will be saying, look, reliability great, it's got good firepower, maybe not brilliant armor protection, but Leopard 1 will still be something that they'll be after and that they can use very effectively. Easy to use. It's a reliable tank and it's relatively easy to learn how to use it. It's of the same generation as some of those earlier T-64s, T-72s that uh, already the Ukrainian army is used to. And David, this is the T-72. What are its main features? So this is almost what you might call a typical Soviet era tank that now the modern Russian army is using. You can see just generally as you step back that low profile. That's because the Russians starting with a tank called the T-64, they got rid of the loader. That's the person who's got to put those rounds in the breech, needs a bit of room. They ended up putting a carousel system, an auto loader in there, which meant that the tank could be lower. And if you're lower in profile, you're harder to see and hit. Mm. Mm. It's got a 125 millimeter smooth bore gun. So again, it's a sizable gun. The problem that the Russians have been finding is if this tank is penetrated, whether we see by top attack, end law weapons, other ways of firing at it, because of that auto loader system, that tends to be too, it just hasn't got enough protection. So if you are penetrated, that will detonate mm. the propellant that actually is firing those rounds out the end. Hence, we've been seeing these pretty appalling pictures of turrets blowing off all over the place. Um, as you look at the vehicle, it's got what they call aggressive track on it. They don't bother with rubber track. They put the armor protection is really on the front. That dates back to the Cold War days where we knew what uh, direction the enemy was always coming from. If you look in modern parlance now, one of the things they've been trying to do is put more protection on the top of the tanks, the rear of the tanks and the sides. Mm. Um, and you'll see these things that they've been building over the top. They're calling them coat cages, trying to detonate rounds coming from above before they hit the main hull. But as far as we've seen, they're not really doing much more in the way of protection um, than the original armor was doing. Um, so there's a lot of these tanks still out there. Probably any two of them aren't the same because mm. over time, upgrades have happened with the Russian military. Um, again, there's a number of these being captured by the Ukrainians, they're using them. They've added reactive armor, what they mm. call contact five, these little blocks of reactive armor over them as well. So again, it's one of these ones where sometimes when you're looking at the imagery, it is quite hard to work out what's under all those add-ons, mm. um, what's the basic model, but an awful lot of T-72s still out there. So David, this is the Challenger 2, and there are currently 12 supplied by the UK out in Ukraine. Yeah, it doesn't sound that much, does it, sort of thing, but one of the most elite units, the 82nd Air Assault Brigade, were the ones that came over to Bovington, learned how to use the Challenger 2. And even though it's only a small number, you know, still that's 12 tanks that they didn't have before. And I also think as well, with Britain giving the Challenger, it was also, it opened the gates. You know, mm. it was really a very symbolic gesture at the beginning of the year, where because we said we were doing it, other countries then stepped up to the plate and that led that flow of NATO tanks. Is it symbolic and also perhaps psychologically significant as well? The tank itself, you know, they absolutely loved it. With the Ukrainians who were here training on it, think it's great because it's very well protected. Um, it's got tremendous firepower and historically, you know, thank goodness, up to this moment in time, we haven't certainly lost a British soldier um, has not been killed in a Challenger 2. Now, it's been in service with the British Army for about 20 years. Um, let's not, as I mentioned earlier, let's not kid ourselves. These tanks will get knocked out. It's inevitable. That's what combat's like in the future. 
but the fact that they're using these as a potential, um, well, we assume they're going to be using them as a potential force for a breakout because they're so well protected, you can do things in a Challenger 2 that you can't do in a T72. What can you do? That you can't well, do? it's the very fact that it's, it can travel to places and engage at distances with its sighting systems, number one, you know, most of the Western tanks have got better sights. They can fight at night as well, which not all of those Russian tanks can do. Some of them being upgraded that they can do that. But also the levels of protection give the crew on these vehicles a level of confidence of what they can risk and what they can achieve on the battlefield. Now, it's always problematic because they haven't had an enormous amount of time to get used to these vehicles. So it's a bit like, um, I always do the family car analogy, you know, if you were a Formula One car or your car, actually you need a lot of training to get the best from a Formula One if you're gonna try and, you know, do a race or something. Today, you'd probably be better off in your family car, wouldn't you? So with this Western technology, we've got to make sure that we give enough training time to the Ukrainians and hence, Zelensky was very keen not only to get the kit, but to make sure his army's ready before he uses it. What are its vulnerabilities? I think personally it's less to do with the tank, it's more to do with the supply of spare parts. This is a tank that the British military are basically seeing go out of service as we're getting ramping up for Challenger 3. Um, so in the sense of keeping it going, we've allowed our ammunition stocks to dwindle to very little. Don't forget, for the British military, the last 20 years, it's been counterinsurgency, not the idea of big boys, wars, tank on tank. So obviously that's caused the British military to have a very quick look at our stocks, our holdings, and how long we're going to keep this tank running and getting service for. You mentioned about the importance of having the parts, the replacement parts for these kind of tanks. How much do you think the logistics is going to change the balance of this war? the supply of what's needed. Yeah, I think, as I mentioned, the Ukrainians are getting used to that idea. They've got very sophisticated systems for trying to keep this, you know, plethora of different weapon systems, the spare parts, the ammunition, the different types, trying to make sure that the right ammunition is going to the right vehicle or the right weapon system is obviously, you know, it's problematic. It's a major issue, but they're doing it and they're having to do that. So they're finding ways um, in, in very clever ways that we are learning back from the Ukrainians. Don't forget that NATO countries, you know, we're learning from also how the Ukrainians are fighting and that's something we need to continue to do because there's a number of these areas as well. It's not just spare parts keeping those vehicles going. It's the phrase tempo. It's the speed that the Ukrainians are engaging the enemy and counter battery fires coming back. These are all things that in the West after all that period of not thinking of this type of warfare again, we've got to relearn that because we're a bit slow. So these tanks are already out there. They're still waiting for the Abrams tanks. When are they arriving and how much of a difference will they make? I think the Abrams, they won't probably get there to the autumn at the earliest. Um, challenges are already there. Other tanks are on their way. Um, there's also upgrade programs going on in a number of tanks that have been promised. The key one is sustaining a credible force for the Ukrainians, so they'll never have a perfect number, but it does look like they've got that 300 tanks that Zelensky was particularly keen on getting before he started his offensive. So what will be interesting, as I may keep saying, is we will see these tanks being knocked out, degraded, broken down, interdicted in lots of different ways. That doesn't mean to say his campaign is going to fail, because that's what warfare's like. We will be resupplying, we will have to be doing that again. And again, that's where NATO's got to start seriously thinking, are we gonna restart? In some areas, we're already doing it with artillery shells. Are we gonna start perhaps production lines going again for not just the spare parts, but whole vehicles? So David, this is a Russian tank. Do we know how many tanks Russia has on the battlefield at the moment? We know at the beginning of the campaign, they had about 3,000 tanks. The Ukrainians had only about a third of that number. The issue is really the Russians had huge numbers of other tanks still in reserve. But what's been interesting is how they found that what they thought was in reserve are sometimes vehicles have been cannibalized for other parts. Um, precious metals on some of the circuitry had been stolen, it turns out. 
So they're having to put tanks through a rebuild program to get them fit enough on the battlefield. What they do have is earlier generation tanks that are still there. And because some of those are fairly basic vehicles, fairly crude, we in the West have tended to sort of denigrate that. Actually, it's still a tank. If they can get it going and put it onto the battlefield, if you're a Ukrainian infantryman and this thing's coming towards you, you know, it's still got a threat level to it. Um, you don't need to necessarily uh, worry about the fact that this was made in the 1950s or the 60s. In this particular case, this is a, a, a T-62 tank, you know, back from the 1960s. It's still got a powerful gun on it. It's still going to be able to protect the crew against small arms fire. So that's one of the things that's really interesting on the Ukrainian battlefield at the moment. We're seeing high-end technology being used on the same day as some very older material and tactics, almost like the First World War, trench systems, etc., machine guns in posts, um, barbed wire, mines, you know, a, an older school of fighting is going on at the same time as we're using high-end missile technology, drones, etc., all on the same day, all on the same battlefield. And there are these tanks on the battlefield. We're the already moment. seeing T that we believe there's some T 54s that have already gone out there. Um, and they are really, that's just the first generation after World War II. But if it works on the day, it's got very little that can go wrong with it. So, of course, in a way, why not use it if they, if they can? And if they can find the spare parts, keep them going, get the crews trained they will be using anything they can. If there are, are T-54s on the battlefield being used, being used by Russia, is that a sign of, of desperation? I think it shows that Putin's plan has gone completely wrong. At the same time, I do think we do have to be careful. Just as we were talking about that Leopard 1 tank, it has a validity for the Ukrainian forces, even though it's a tank from the 1960s originally when it was designed. Actually, if you can still use that, militaries are quite happy to accept older kit if it still does the function that's needed. Um, the only thing is, it's so obvious that Putin's original campaign has completely failed because he was hoping to keep this myth going of the advanced Russian forces using much more later technology. Um, that's just not worked for him. So they're having to go back to much deeper in their historic stocks of material trying to have to recruit all over again. But again, from the point of view of morale, everything else, we've seen that that's just not working for them in the way he hopes. When you say that President Putin wanted to have this uh, image of having the latest, most modern technology, we hear of the T-14 Armata. Does this tank exist? What, what, what... Yeah, so what, one of the things that traditionally the Soviets have tried to keep their tanks under about 40 tonnes. They look very similar, this frying pan shaped turrets as part of Putin's modernization program, about 2005, he goes to the Russian military. He's starting to invest again his oil and gas money into the military, make them feel proud of themselves again, give them new uniform, give them new kit. And as part of that, this T-14 program, it becomes, uh, there was going to be a family of vehicles built on the same hull. The Armata was the tank version, T-14 Armata. That Really, they only ended up with about 20 pre-production vehicles. It never went into full production. Lots of the technology on that vehicle actually came from other sources other than Russia. So the sites came from France. There's uh, software that, again, when the sanctions start going in place, he's not able to sustain that as a production run. And the Russians themselves, you know, if those vehicles see combat, it will really be for propaganda reasons, not because they're an effective vehicle on the battlefield. Can you tell us how important a role the tank has played so far in the war in Ukraine and how that role might be changing? Well, I think we've gone through that period. If you just think about, think of the media a year ago, the end of the tank, end laws, etc., knocking out Russian tanks. So what seemed so easily when they were first attacking and yet we've gone through that period where now we realize the Ukrainians are asking the West for so many more tanks and we are supplying tanks. So I think we've seen that pendulum swing back. Why is it that the Ukrainians now want tanks? It's because when you attack and when you want to take ground, you've got to advance. You can't just use air power. You can't just, someone's got to be there and do it. And to do that effectively, even in this modern era where there's so many risks to a tank, mm. 
a tank still has a utility on the battlefield few other weapons match. So that's why the Ukrainians want those vehicles so they can start taking back the land that the Russians have occupied. And we're standing here in front of the Leopard 1. There are also Leopard 2s already out. Can you just tell us how many Leopard 1s are going and how many Leopard 2s are out? And what kind of comparison you can make between that and what the Russians have? Yes, yeah, so the West NATO in particular, NATO countries have picked on Leopard because there's about 3,000 to be made overall. And the fact that they're available in quantity, their spare parts, their servicing, a number of nations have employed Leopard 1 and then moved on to Leopard 2. Now there's fewer, there's probably about 60 Leopard 2s in country at the moment. Everyone's a little bit cagey about saying, you know, when they've been delivered, what model, etc. in that way. Understandably so, because mm. no one wants to give it away too much. But the idea that there's over 120 Leopard 1s potentially going to be put together that's sent out there, a relatively older tank, but at the same time, used in the right way, could still be very effective on the battlefield. Now, one of the questions that a lot of people ask is, with this plethora of different models, different training regimes, different spare parts needed, how do the Ukrainians cope with this? Um, to put it bluntly, the Ukrainians have made themselves cope with it. They've got so many different weapon systems, so they've been coming up with a barcoding for spare parts, they've been coming up with imaginative ways of making sure the right ammunition is going to the right place at the right time. And obviously NATO countries are offering as much support to keep these vehicles going in country as they possibly can. And that's going to be quite important because I just think at the moment we're in those early stages of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. We will be seeing an awful lot of NATO tanks being either knocked out, broken down, etc. And we've just got to be careful we don't just think that's the end of that then or they've lost. No, they haven't. That's part of warfare. And with the counteroffensive underway, how do you think these tanks are going to be used on the battlefield? In what kind of areas? Because obviously we know with the, the bursting of the dam, the, the dam that there are huge areas that are now out of bounds for tanks. Yeah, so I think it's so far um, what we've been seeing is mainly probing attacks, use of tanks that way. Um, we haven't seen, we have seen some of the Leopards being involved there. We've also seen, completely unverified yet, but it does look like some of those Leopards have already been knocked out. Um, but what I will be interested to see is if the Ukrainians put in a sizeable attack using their armoured forces. And we don't know when, and we're not going to say even if we did know, of course, but uh, that idea of watch this space, because so far, I think what we've just been watching so far are the early days of probing using tanks in small numbers, not how they might be used, which is a sizable tank force doing a dramatic breakthrough and an encircling movement. So what does a sizable force look like? We're looking then at things like battalion size, 30 plus, and we know some of those Ukrainian battalions that are training or have been training with Leopard 2, A5s, A6s and more modern versions. And don't forget, we're still looking. We've got other vehicles. We've got Challenger 2 that's already out there in theatre um, with the 82nd Air Assault Brigade. The, these are the best of the Ukrainian forces. They were the ones who were here at Bovington training with this. Um, let's wait till we see them go into action and then we may be seeing a very different picture on the battlefield. How will these tanks be able to penetrate further than the first line of defence the Russians have erected? So one of the things that NATO countries have been trying to help the Ukrainians train, you know, they've, they've got a pretty sophisticated armed force in the first place that's had to expand. But NATO has been given them this idea of mission command. In other words, go out there. This is the aim. We're not going to control every moment of how you achieve that aim as the tendency is with the traditional Soviet and now Russian forces. But the other idea is that idea of combined arms. We've talked about the tank a lot, but actually that needs to be used effectively with a combination with engineers. The engineers will clear that path through the minefield with infantry support so that they don't get ambushed from the side. You have your dismounts, as they're called, out keeping a protection on those flanks. You need, where possible, air support. You need that full use of your artillery to target positions that you're going to be advancing on. 
that combined together, I think we'll see a level of sophistication in some of these Ukrainian attacks with their better quality units um, that I've, I've a feeling we haven't necessarily seen so far. The Russians claim to have knocked out some Leopard tanks in the Zaporizhia region and elsewhere um, using drone attacks. Is that possible? Yeah, I think it is. And I think we've just got to be honest with ourselves as well. Zelensky himself has said, look, you know, Russian Ukrainian soldiers are going to die in this attack. Mm. Um, we are going to lose equipment in scale that perhaps NATO in the West we look at and we're horrified by. The Ukrainians are getting much more used to that as an idea. There is a cost to war. And the fact that some of these vehicles that we've been bigging up in a certain way in NATO countries, etc., inevitably they are going to be destroyed in these attacks. The key thing for the Ukrainians is they achieve their ultimate aim. It doesn't matter if at the end of the day, 99 out of 100 of those tanks are left on the battlefield, destroyed or broken down or whatever, as long as at the end of the day that one tank's remaining and they've achieved their objective. If you have tanks that are left on the battlefield, as you say, how do you recover them? Well, NATO has also been supplying some recovery tanks so that we can pull back those vehicles that are broken down, etc. Um, but even there, with the best support in the world, I just think that what we don't want to do is give a false impression that what NATO is supplying or the West is supplying to the Ukraine is so good that the minute one of them gets knocked out, it's almost, that's it, we've got to go home and start all over again. That's just not going to be the case. And you can see the Ukrainians are learning that as a situation um, that they've got to be able to tell them. We've almost, as a media, got to tell the West as well that just because one of these things, and tanks also, why they're picked on is they're so symbolic of power. So when you see one destroyed, as these, you know, you can see why the Russians are so keen to point out, here's one of these leopards destroyed, because psychologically, this is, you know, the ultimate land power, isn't it? A big, heavy tank. So if you can destroy it, is that the end of it? Well, no, it's not. The Ukrainians are going to come with more tanks, more sophisticated tactics. They're going to learn how they're operating these vehicles to ultimately, I would argue, see success. You've had Ukrainian forces here to be trained at the museum. Um, what do you teach them? It's um, tricky. Well, obviously, they're learning here at Bovington how to use Challenger 2. They've been coming down to learn earlier a year ago. CVRT, lighter vehicles were being trained here. We've um, entertained them in the evenings. We've used historical examples from different periods. How militaries think of our own home guard in World War II. They were being taught, how do we stop tanks? How can we perhaps delay them? What little techniques are out there that we can pass on? And that's one of the pleasures we've had, which is... However naive some of these ideas may be, you know, to the point of Second World War, you know, dinner plates upturned in the road, painted grey, might be a mine. Don't forget, a driver in a tank has got very little vision. So anything we can give those forces to make them hopefully more optimistic and better in the fight, that's been part of our role. So using a historic collection to help train them, you know, that's been a, a, a genuine insight and real pleasure for us. Is there any evidence to your knowledge that anybody on either side is using uh, decoy, fake tanks on the battlefield? I absolutely, but couldn't possibly tell you that. But um, the, the, the whole idea through history, decoys and deception, um, the Russian military has always been good at that. So are the Ukrainians. We're getting better in the West as well. But um, again, it's another one of those. Just be a little bit careful what we're seeing and how it's being reported. Misinformation, as well as decoys, you know, on the actual battlefield. That's going to be part of the campaign from both sides, isn't it? So um, we need to be very careful. And we also understand why, certainly looking at the Ukrainians, why they're going to be doing that. We might be looking here, that gives the excuse to assemble their forces over there. So the use of decoys is something that's gone on through history. We'd be very surprised if it's not going on in the Ukraine at the moment. Well, I've just nipped outside to take a look at a tank that came before the Challenger 2. This is the Challenger 1, the older version of the Challenger 2, the British Army's main battle tank, 12 of which have been sent to Ukraine. Let's take this old version for a ride. 
You've been watching Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot, at the Tank Museum, Bovington. My thanks today to David Willey, the curator, and to Louis Sykes, our producer, and to you for watching. I'm off. Bye-bye. <laughs>